understanding that I serve Christ and as I serve other people. Now, folks, I've been doing this a long time. And I, and I have been honored in so many great ways. But when I, I made the transition of my church being the senior leader there, I went from the pulpit to the pew from one Sunday to the next. And I left my church because I had to leave. Now, I, we are two campuses now. And I left my church. And so I started going to my son's other church. My church became a video campus. And then his church was in another city, so he was preaching there. I stepped into a congregation that many of them did not know who I was. Uh, and then if I was introduced, this is Brian's dad. Now, you can say whatever you want to, but the ladies, I can talk to the ladies. The ladies will understand. A man's ego is a horrible thing. It's a horrible thing. I mean, he's 60 years old. He still thinks he's, he looks good in the mirror. Amen. How is it that a man can look in the mirror and go, he sees his own self chiseled out, and a woman turns around and looks as, oh, my gosh, I've grown. I look horrible. Men never think that. Jesus said in John 15, 4, Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. When we abide in Christ, we take on His nature, and Jesus gave His life for people. That's why I go to the world. I made the mistake of looking into the eyes of needy people that do not have the gospel. Ladies and gentlemen, you are filthy rich compared to the world. I've ministered in Nepal where the average salary is $17 a month. You have no idea of the poverty of the world and the depravity. I've, been, I've walked through the places where Hinduism and they still do human sacrifices. The, the, it, the, it's it been through the temples and looked at all the things. Been through the Buddhist temples and they don't have the gospel. And it's up to us to go. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. God's called you here. Open up your mouth. Tell someone your testimony. Tell them about what God's done for you. Be ready to pray for someone in the supermarket or the whatever they are around here. Wherever you go, be ready to minister to someone. Because what I found out is this. Humility will bring promotion. I have never... How many in here has ever coached? You, you can have a great young man that's on the football team or on the soccer team, and if he's arrogant and full of himself and not a team player, who wants to use him? And that's the way it is with God. When we humble ourselves, God will prosper us. God's favor will surround us as with a shield. Everything we put our hand to will prosper. See, our, nat our natural strengths begin to fail, but guess what? God gives us strength when we bring ourselves into a place of humility. He will exalt us in this thing called due time. Ye due time. The Greek word there, if any Bible people hear, is kairos. And it's not like the time of day. It's like God's appointed time. At His right time. See, once you gave your life to Jesus, even before that, God was, heaven was busy about seeing you fulfill your destiny. And there's strategic times in your life. Kairos times. Appointed times. The due time. A good illustration of this is, the, is a young man named Joseph. He had a call of God on his life. 17 years old, bragging about it to his older brothers. His brothers hated him for it. So they wanted to kill him. Instead of killing him, they, they sold him into prison. Now how bad is it when your, your brothers hate you so bad they want to murder you and then they send you, sell you for coke money instead? And here Joseph ends up being sold into slavery, put on the auction block, butt naked poor. All he has is a breath in his lungs and a dream in his heart. And, and he doesn't have anything. And he had a, he had a dream. 
And he knew somewhere, somehow, God will fulfill that dream. How many dreamers I have in here? Not the other kind of dreamers. How many in here that have a dream in your heart? And you can have a dream right now. If you're 100 years old, you still have a dream. You need to keep dreams alive in you. So I don't understand about prison. Here, he, 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 Then he, of all things, serving this guy faithfully, Potiphar, and then the, the wife accused him of attempted rape, and he ends up finding himself in prison where he bubbles to the top again because favor will find you out. Now, I don't know how you feel about it. All I did was get a dream. Okay, I told my brothers about it. I shouldn't have told my brothers about it, and it didn't mean it. Now then, here I am in prison. Don't, my dad doesn't know. My dad thinks I'm dead, I guess. And here I am in prison. And it just so happens that it, it, he, Potiphar walked, put him in prison and then told Joseph, said, Joseph, I'm putting two guys in here in prison and I want you to take good care of them. And it was a baker and it was a cupbearer for the, for the Pharaoh. And I don't know how you think about it, but <clears throat> my sister always said, I don't get mad, I get even. He had every opportunity to do wrong by these guys because he was now running the prison. He was the, in charge. And he walks by and he stops and he saw they were sad. <laughs> and he asked them a question. Why are you sad? Duh, we're in prison. And then they said, well, we had dreams. And we don't know what they mean. And then Joseph, he, uh, he says, well, tell me. I have the power to interpret the dream. Just a sideline. In all this stuff going on in his life, he interpreted his own dream. I believe Joseph had figured it out to some extent, maybe not fully, but he'd figured it out. I can interpret dreams. How can he say something that, er that arrogant unless he'd not interpreted his own dream? So they tell him his dream. And he says, well, good news for you, uh, cupbearer. You're, Pharaoh's going to take you back in. Baker, in three days you're going to die. And then he told the cupbearer, remember me before the Pharaoh. <laughs> the things we do, the friendships we make, the people that we kind of get in touch with. Hey, can you elevate me a little bit? Can you help me a little bit? Some folks think they go to the right church, they'll get good business from other people. And here Joseph said, just remember me. I'm an innocent man. I didn't do anything. Talk to me about Pharaoh. Two years, say two years. Two years go by. Forgot about it. Why? It wasn't due time. It wasn't soup yet. Hmm? There's a lot of people that aren't soup yet. It takes time to marinate. We're, you know, <laughs> we're in the microwave. God's into marinating. And I don't care how many times you say, but God, but God, but God, but God, but God, but, God, but time, the ticks, I need, to, I need to be successful now in due time. What do you need to do? Humble yourself in the hand of God. See, so often what we try to do is manipulate God or manipulate people around us to try to be elevated in some degree. And you cannot, I, listen, you cannot, I'll say this one more time, you cannot get God to, get, to manipulate God and get Him to promote you any earlier than what you're supposed to do. If you do get promoted, you will fail. So then... The cupbearer serving the Pharaoh. And Pharaoh was a little troubled. He says, uh, Pharaoh, what's going on? I've had a dream. I can't interpret the dream. And in the midst of that, the guy goes, Oh, I remember this guy named Joseph. Now think with me. As I step in the mud. <laughs> One act of kindness. One act of kindness in a bad situation got Joseph to his destiny. 
one act. What if he'd better had a bad day that day? If he'd walked by and ignored the cupbearer. Or says, I've had a, you know, I'm sad, I've had a dream. Big deal, you're in prison, I've had a bad day too. Suck it up, buttercup. <laughs> so you're having a bad day and you're walking through the parking lot or the, or the checker at the, where, whatever store you shop's not having a good day. And then we have an idea. How do they, they talk to me such a way. Humble yourself. You ain't all that anyway. See, God's got a, a appointed time for your promotion. I believe that God is in the process of promoting every one of you right now as we speak. This is not it for you. There's more written of your story than you know. But so often, we run into difficult times, like Joseph. How many in here hit, nope, not, never mind, all of us in the same boat. We've had difficult times. Things come down our way. And then, you know, if we feel as if that God has abandoned us. I know that you probably never thought that, but sometimes you pray and it feels like He's not listening. Is anybody? Yeah. And, uh, and then... We start to worry about our family, our finances, health, whatever it may be. And then the scripture tells us <clears throat> to cast all our care. Because He cares for us. Cast all your care. Cast all your worry upon Jesus. For He cares for you. If you have a difficulty too heavy to carry, Jesus is saying, give it to me. So actually tonight... We're going to have the opportunity to leave here worry-free. And I ain't kidding. I'm not blowing smoke up your dress. This is the real deal. Jesus is inviting you. Give me, He says to you, your burdens. He wants to carry them. So you take all the worry, all the stress, all the things you can't control, and Jesus says, give them to me. Casting all your care. Care. Ah, the word care. It describes any difficulty that causes you to be concerned or fearful. Cast whatever's causing you to worry. What thoughts are keeping you up at night? What do you think of going to bed and what do you think of when you wake up? It's that drip, drip, drip thought, that worry, that fear, that concern. What negative thought is stealing your joy? What thoughts are stealing your peace? What thoughts are causing you to be fearful? See, we all see that there's, there's this proverbial war going all the way around us all the time Attempting to steal this abundant life that Jesus gave us. Now care defined is this. The Greek word gives us a picture. And it describes a piece of cloth that is torn or frayed. And you, ladies, you've seen it. We've all seen it. Where you tear a piece of garment where it's so torn, it's frayed at the edges. You, unless you cut it off, you can't, you can't repair it. It's frayed. And it says, cast all your care, anything that's emotionally got you frayed, anything that's got you all tore up on the inside, things that you're overly concerned about, take those things and give them to Jesus. A good illustration of this. It's like a, a distant storm. You can hear it roaring all around you, taunting you, and, and in your mind you think Tornado Alley. Something's headed my way. That's the idea we get about care. Now at Mark 4.19, it says, and he's talking about the parable of the sower, and when the Word of God is sown, it's sown among thorns. What's it sown among? Sown among thorns. And the thorns represent difficulty in life. 
And so, the, so people hear the word, and the cares of this world choke the word of God or the promises of God until the faith, your faith, my faith, becomes unfruitful. That means the fear or the care now outweighs the promises of God in my life to the degree that I can't have fruit. I can't come boldly to the throne room of grace because I feel, I feel condemned. Doesn't matter what comes my way, I find myself in a place of being unfruitful. When we, when we, when the care or the problem becomes louder than the promises of the Word of God, then the Word of God is being choked out of our life. That bad report from the doctor becomes so loud that the healing power of Christ becomes so distant to you. You can't believe it. That wayward son, that wayward grandson, that, that rebellious, that you feel in your heart the devil will steal him, kill him before he has the, uh, him or her that has the ability to give their lives to Christ. See, thorns are painful and they attempt to disguise themselves as being permanent. And you become powerless when we become overcome with this pain and the Word of God is choked out of our lives and to the point where we become unfruitful. I don't want to be unfruitful because the Word of God says, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth. I believe that we're supposed to walk in the double portion anointing. I believe that we're supposed to, everything we put our hand to is to prosper. Listen, Jesus didn't die for a weak, defeated church. He died for an overcoming church. That's who you are. I don't know, when we get pray and in difficult times, we pray and it seems, you ever had the thought, God, don't you care? God, don't you care? And that's what the enemy spends all of his time on. He wants you to believe that God does not care. Where I go in the world, they have a caste system. We, you have no idea about prejudice until you travel India. And the caste system there is this. You're born a slave, basically a servant, and you will never, ever get any better. I was walking through, uh, I was staying at an at a Indian man's, Asian Indian man's house there, and I, and I came down, there's about a 14, 15 year old girl, and she's his servant. She's sleeping on the floor. He's got three empty beds. She's on a tile floor with a blanket. That's it. And I look at it in disapproval. I guess he saw and he, he said, well, listen. In India, the woman pays the dowry for the man. So she's got to buy her man. And he says, she'll never be able to marry a man that will be able to buy her a bed. So if I let her sleep in a bed, she'd be too spoiled. And that still did not change my opinion of the man that didn't let the girl sleep in the bed. <laughs> as he tried to justify that. Anyway. So we get the idea that Jesus doesn't care. Jesus announces one day, so hey, let's go to the other side. The disciples all get on board. And they begin to go to the other side. The storm rages and thunder comes in and it looks like that they're going to die. And where's Jesus? He's asleep on a pillow. As Jesus sleeps on the pillow, uh, they go down and they, they wake him up, the King of kings, Lord of lords, and says, Lord, <coughs> don't you care? We're going to die. And Jesus got up, walked, well, he got the sleep out of his eye, Walks up, steps up, and says, Peace to the storm. And then Jesus returned to them, returned to them and says, Why are you fearful? And why is it you have no faith? Now, Jesus is on the boat. Is the boat going down? If, if the disciples don't wake up Jesus, is the boat going down? Just, say it with your mouth. Everybody on it. Is the boat going down? 
Is Jesus on your boat? Are you going down? Pretty good theology, isn't it? Someone said, well, if they wouldn't had to walk him up. I got a whole nother sideline about that. If 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 they had if if they after Jesus quieted the storm, they marveled and said, Who is this? Who is this? Who is this that can calm the storm and quiet the sea? Who is this? They So why did they wake Jesus up? They'd never seen him calm the storm before. Why did they wake him up? Never seen him done it. So why, why did they wake him up? Very simple. If you're going down, boat's going down, and you're on a primitive boat, everybody's got a bucket. you got to get the water off or you're going to go down. And I really believe with all my heart, they're standing there with a bucket with Jesus. and said, Jesus? And that's what we do in prayer sometimes. The God that can do anything. And we give Jesus a bucket. Jesus, bail us out. Help us, Jesus. So I really believe that we have the ability, and also I'll say, why, if you want to really get theological about it, Jesus never taught storm calming 101. This is the first time that they, he ever calmed a storm in front of them, and yet he rebuked them because they were fearful and had no faith. What did Jesus want the disciples to do? Believe what? For what? What were they supposed to do? Believe what? No, 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 but Jesus, why did they wake Jesus up? Now then, why did He get mad for waking Him up? Why? Huh? Now the reason why is because they said, Jesus is thinking, why didn't you calm the storm? I've taught you authority and power. Why didn't you speak to the storm? And let me get my sleep. You walk in more authority than you know. You have no idea with the name of Jesus how much power and authority you have. My daughter-in-law was driving and she had my two grandchildren and they were small. Now, <clears throat> we're Texas folks. She, she, my grandson calls his sister Bub. His sister calls him Bub. They both call each other Bub. It works for him, I don't understand. Bub. So they're in, in car seats, and then, and then the car breaks down. It's hot. So my daughter-in-law side of the road, she's calling to try to get help. And it's hot. Texas is hot. And my daughter-in-law goes, my daughter, excuse me, my granddaughter, which is a little dramatic. <clears throat> We're going to die! We're going to die, Mama. We're going to die. And my grandson, which is a year younger than her, says, Bub, we ain't going to die. It's just hot. <laughs> mm. Then the scripture says, be sober. Goes from casting all your care to say be sober. <laughs> now wait a minute. All right, let's let's put this in context, guys. Let's be Bible students right now. Be sober. Nowhere in here God's talked about alcohol. Be sober. God's not talking about getting drunk. It it, it makes no sense because it the, in, in the subject is is care. Not alcohol. Now why did suddenly the scriptures go for casting all your care be sober? What is God trying to say here? I, I didn't understand it. And then one day I realized, oh, you can get drunk on worry. And when you're drunk on worry, you can't think straight. 
You can't be responsible with money. Your judgment's impaired. You can't make good decisions. You feel sorry for yourself. Life's all about you. You lose control of your emotions. You get angry easily. Your imagination becomes so negative that all you can see is the bad things that can happen to you. You're drunk on worry. And ladies and gentlemen, the church of Jesus Christ is inebriated with worry worldwide. So often we become, we overreact. We don't act in faith. We overreact. We spin. We suddenly scream out, Oh, he has cancer! He's going to die! No, he'll live and not die! You have to make a determination. People that are drunk on worry can't make good decisions. They're, 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 not, they're not themselves. They're impaired. And I get it. When you get a bad report, hey, <laughs> just keep your mouth shut and get sober. Just stay quiet until you can get your faith under you. I've been there where I think when something tragic happens that you didn't see coming, immediately you just go, oh man, I'm, I'm blunt force trauma, I'm hit. You've got to wait and get your faith feet under you so you can respond in faith. Just stay quiet. Cast all of your care to Him because He cares for you. He promote, he's going to promote you. He's after something good. Now, when you cast, we, we cast, we probably get the idea of a fisherman. He goes out and he, he uh, cast. And then he reels it back. That's not the biblical definition, but it gives us a good picture of what we do. Because what we do in difficult times, we go to the Lord and we say, Lord Jesus, here I am. Lord, I've got this difficulty, this problem, this financial situation. I've got all these things going on in my life. And I cast this care over onto you. And then... We see our best friends. Oh, let me tell you what's going on in my life. <laughs> I've been praying about it and praying about it. We call a relative or two. Anybody to listen to. And next thing you know, we're sitting there and we got it all back. And we're, we're sitting there and it gets so bad. So, well, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, Lord Jesus, I cast this care over unto you. And we repeat. And we repeat. And we repeat. You're to cast everything that concerns you over on to Jesus. Cast the money problem. The marriage problem. The bib, 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 I'm a professional communicator. The business problem. I'm going to go and say this. The addiction that you struggle with that you're ashamed of? It doesn't surprise God. Give it to Him. Cast it over onto Him. Health issues, problems. Give Him every problem that concerns you. Give it to Him. Your, whatever causes you to worry and be concerned, you have the opportunity to give it over onto Jesus and so that you can live a stress-free, abundant life. Sound like a good idea? Now, the biblical meaning to casting is this. is You take a heavy load, too difficult for you to carry, and you put it forcefully over on a beast of burden. And here it, it would be a donkey, or a, a horse, or, or a truck. Uh, if, if anybody here ever go up in the mountains, go elk hunting? Yeah, how many ever here ever took sheep up there with you to carry the load for you? Any got anybody got any sheep that carry loads? Anybody any 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 pack sheep anywhere? You know anybody's got pack sheep anywhere? Nowhere. You never seen them anywhere. Why? 
Why? Because they don't what? They're unable to. Say, bah! You sheep. You're not designed. You're not designed to carry it. It's not in your DNA anywhere to carry pressure or stress of any kind. None. Give Him all that you worry about. He will, says, I want to be your burden bearer. Now, I'm not calling Jesus a donkey, but still it gives us a good analogy. He said, oh, hey, give it to me. I'll do it. Now, <clears throat> can He carry this section's burdens? Right, come on there. Can He? Yes. Could Jesus take this section's? Could he, could he carry it all raton? Yes. Is there any limits? No. So why won't we give him what he can carry? Cast the worry, the fear. Cast it over onto him. Just like you take something and put it on a truck. You put it there. And then you get in the truck and you drive the truck. You don't even think about the load. It's there. Jesus doesn't think about the load. It doesn't bother him at all. How many moms, you've gone somewhere and you, you, you're shopping and you've got the cart. And as you walk through the, around the, the, the cart and, and, and you've got a little, little, let's say little Billy. Little Billy's following you and he's helping you shop. And, and you, you determine you're going to get uh, 10 pounds of ba bag of beans. In your, and, and Billy says, whoop, as I fall on my rear end. He says, he says Mom. Let me carry the beans. Well, Billy, I, I, you don't have to carry the beans. You just go have fun. Have, you just follow me and have fun and play. And here's, you know, your cars, play cars. And just, no, Mama, I want to help you. Let me carry the beans. All right, Billy, carry the beans. So mom's in there. You know, she's in there 30 minutes or so. And Billy, he's, at first he's pretty good. Now then Billy's... And then next thing you know, he got on the ground. He's pulling it around. He, he do, why, what's he trying to do? He's trying to help mama, isn't he? He wants to be a helper, right? Don't we have a Holy Spirit called the helper? Anyway, he's dragging it, dragging it along, doing everything he can to try to help mama. And mama says, looks at us and says, hey, hey, are you tired of carrying that? It's no effort for me, son. Just let me take it from you and put it in the car. And that's the way we're supposed to do. That's good. Well, I'm responsible. I should carry my own load. You're full of it. You're your own God, I guess. I've tried Lord Terry. He's a sorry Lord. Sorry. We were never created to carry problems. You've just heard, well, they're going to downsize. I may lose my job. Why does your mind suddenly take what I call hearsay information and suddenly build a scenario for yourself that you think that you're all will be lost? Why not just say, yeah, well, hey, if they're downsizing, I'm probably going to get promoted. Huh? You've got to start looking at things differently. You, people, get, people get a bad report from the doctor. Your kids are rebellion. You know, it, it, we get all these things that come at us. Begin to look at the things that what God, heaven's busy about the things that are important to you. And it says, hey, come on. Don't worry. Well, the economy. Well, you're not tied to this economy. You're tied to heaven's economy. And if you give, it will be given back to you. How? Barely scraped by. Huh? Good measure. Pressed down. Shaking together. Running over. Will God give back to you? I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their seed begging bread. Well, I, I you know, invested. It all went south. Well, bless God. It can go north. Come on. Aren't you tired of carrying the load? Aren't you tired of being emotionally strained? Well, I worry about my children so much. Stop it. My business, stop it. 
Do you realize that once you start worrying about things, all of your creativity leaves you? You can't think about other things to do. You can't think outside the box. Why? Because all you're thinking about, you're navel gazing. You're just thinking about you. And not, God never designed it to be about you. It's about others. Well, we want to see this region changed, but life's all about me. Because you're covered up with problems. And when you get this, your life will forever change. Today, or tonight, whenever it is, we're going to cast all our burdens over to Jesus tonight. Thank you for your enthusiasm. It's a roar. Ah! I'm going to walk out of here so light, I'm going to lose 50 pounds tonight. Glory to God. Amen. My butt's going to shrink when I leave. Praise Jesus. Things are good. I took over a church. It was in, it was it was in nine one one, man. I mean, this baby was headed for the cliff. They put me in the driver's seat. I pulled back the reins, and I didn't think you'd make it. I told you all the stuff that's going on in this church. I took over. You, it would it would amaze you what was going on. And I remember I would come in. Missy, I'd walk over my. Wife. I said, "Babe, let me tell you something." And I tell her about the problem. I said, they hadn't paid payroll taxes in three and a half years. I said, that's $10,500 not counting penalties and interest. I said, babe, you don't understand. I said, I said there's a mechanics lien against the property. Of, and it's going to be $15,000. I said, we're in a lawsuit. I, and I, we opened up the first Sunday in there. We opened up $15,000, oh, let's see, $1,200 worth of past due bills. And I had a $2,500 a month mortgage and I preached my first Sunday to 20 people. And I said, baby, what are we, 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 we going to do? We, we need to get this. And don't you get mad when people won't worry with you? <laughs> Some of you look at me, well, don't look at me that holy way. You get mad when people won't worry with you. No, and I said, I said babe, I, yeah. she, she says, <laughs> give it to Jesus. You want, listen, you want to slap people that say that. No, worry with me. You don't understand. You don't understand the pressure I'm under to make this church go. Forgetting that the scripture says you labor in vain unless the Lord builds the house. Well, they got their head in the clouds. They never worry about anything. They're irresponsible. Come on, family. Who's right here? She's right. Give it to Jesus. Another lady. She lived a hundred years old, and and uh, they she asked for they asked her for a life. What, how do you live a happy life like this? How? And she said. I used to worry about everything. The truth is, I've had a lot of trouble, most of which never happened. <laughs> worry is wasting today's time on yesterday's troubles and tomorrow's problems. Worry can cause heart attacks, strokes, high blood pressure, depression. It makes difficult one difficult to sleep. Worry causes sickness. Creates mean, judgmental people. Worry makes you work harder at life. You're tired all the time. Worry steals your faith. It robs your joy. Steals your peace. Tips to destroy your hopes and your dreams. And when you're drunk on worry, and your face not working, and whatever you, decision you make is the wrong decision, you get stuck on stupid. You hit the stupid button and make bad decisions. And how many have done that? Never make a decision in worry and fear. Never, ever, ever, ever. What happens with worry is we become like the dog that worries the bone. He grabs a hold of it and he, and he worries it and worries it and worries it and worries it and just crabs it. And how many have done that over issues in your life? And after the end of it you say, well, why do I worry about it? It all worked out anyway. 
How many's done things like, oh my God, my world's going to come to an end. And next thing you know, you got blue skies and everything's great and no problems whatsoever and God worked it out. Why in the world do we spend such effort on such stupid stuff? See, what happens, the enemy comes in, he plants some thought of pending doom and t con tries to convince us that God doesn't care. He doesn't, content he doesn't care. Oh my goodness. And then, and so what do you do now? There's only one way to do this. You've got to replace the thoughts with the thoughts that God wants you to think. And you control your thoughts. Philippians 4.8. Philippians 4.8. This is what you do. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, Whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are a good report. If there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Meditate on these things. This side note, if you're a book reader, there's a book out there called The 4-8 Principle. Made up on the 4-8 the, the here. It's basically how to live a joy-filled life. So... A book that you could read if you're into reading. See, your mind is mental real estate that the enemy wants. And he wants to occupy as much territory as possible. And when your mind is full of thorns to the promises of God, then you're unable to produce fruit in your mind. You have to monitor your thoughts. Everything goes through this filter. Everything goes through this filter. And if, it, and if it's, any of this is outside of that, then you cast it out. Take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. If your thoughts are negative, then what you do is you say, no, I'm not going to think this. I have traveled. And I have, listen, when, when you travel, and you think it's romantic travel, sometimes travel turns into total hysteria, craziness, and I just lose, I'm going somewhere to preach the gospel, and I'm going to kill someone along the way. It's the gospel truth. I want to slap some people in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. I'm telling you, man. I mean, I've, you, can't, you can't make up the stupidity that, you, that I come in contact with other than me trying to react to it. See, see, you would never invite a thief into your house. So why would you allow thoughts that steal your joy, your peace, to make yourself at home in your mind? You've got a thief. And he's in the church. You've lost your happiness. You live in depression. You have no confidence for your future. There's a thief in the house. And no one can throw him out but you. Pastor can lay hands on you till you're bald headed. That's how I lost my hair. I'm telling you, it won't work. Only when you take authority in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You have authority. You have to renew your mind with the promises of God. You have to put the scriptures in your heart and meditate upon them. Well, I don't like to read. Then, then get on a smart device that's smarter than you and have it read to you. Find some way of getting the Word of God in you. Renew your mind. Because why? You have an adversary, the devil, that walks about as a roaring lion, seeking who he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith. Now, I've got to hurry because I'm going, I've got a lot to give you here. And I'm just going to yell, can, are we doing all right? Are you, are you thoroughly all right still with me? Receiver still open? Can I go a little longer? All right. When you get a negative thought, think the opposite. You're going to lose your job. I'm going to get a promotion. If I lose this job, I'm going to get a better one. I, I'm ha having stories. i got to stop. Stop telling stories. Get the word in you. You resist him by thinking and confessing what things are true. What do you have? The word of God. You confess what the word says. You confess what the Word says. Meditate on the Word. Dwell on your blessings. Dwell on your strengths. Yeah, you got shortcomings. Big deal. We all do. 
Don't stare at don't stare at the problem. Stare at the at, at, at the the provision that God's given you, the potential that you have. Dwell on the blessings. Now to that, my avid, th- this is what I want to do. I want to re- recruit you to become an orthonologist. How many know what an orthonologist is? Two people. It's a bird watcher. You learned a new word today, did you? I had to look it up myself, so now we're in the same boat. I seemed real educated, didn't I? <laughs> Heck yeah! <laughs> now then, pay attention. Because I'm about to give you something that's going to change your life forever. Jesus is speaking. Our Lord. And he says in Matthew 6, 25 through 26. I want him to get it up there so everybody can see it. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value than they? Now, can we come to the conclusion that you're more valuable than a bird? Come on, my church family, agree with me. All right. The the Amplified Bibles, which of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? Jesus tells us, do not worry. And then he gives us an example. Look at the birds of the air. The birds of the air, they don't sow or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. You're more valuable than they are. Birds don't have a bank account, right? Birds don't have a grocery store to go to, correct? They can't store their food in a barn, is that right? Now listen to me. Birds wake up every morning broke, hungry, and singing about it. That's why drunks can't bird watch. (laughs) So if you're having a bad day, get yourself a cup of coffee and go out and sit on the back porch and look at the birds. And if one falls, comes over and falls to the ground and you can tell that it's starved to death, then you might be concerned about it. Everywhere I see, birds are pretty fat. My wife likes to feed them. And I said, that's useless feeding. Well, they get some close so I can watch them. Anyway. Look at the birds. If you're drunk on worry, look at the birds. Sober up. Well, I made a a mess of my life. Hey, Hey, do you know what bad mistakes are? Bad mistakes are good fertilizer. But don't pile them all up in one big pile. You spread them all out. And then God's going to grow something great from it. Because God causes all things to work together for good. Now then, I think this is my final scripture, Matthew 11, 28. As I close. Jesus is speaking. Come to me, all who are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Jesus is inviting you to give Him everything which concerns you. If you're struggling with depression, struggling with with any condition that causes you to worry or have pressure, Jesus is inviting to give it to Him today. Give it all to Him. And then you find people that, well, we've been raised certain ways. We've come from certain doctrinal backgrounds and in intercession we're taught by intercessors. I'm just carrying a burden from the Lord. 
The burden weighs upon me as I cry out to the Lord God under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The Lord has just put such a heavy weight upon me as I pray for all people. Nope. You're doing something wrong. Because his burden is heavy. No, his burden's what? That means when you pray, you believe God's moving. Your faith's working. Only when you're in despair, you believe God won't come through. And then you're heavy laden. You're heavy laden. The enemy's after something. He's after light-hearted, free Christians. And he wants to entangle them with lies to the point that they can't give what they have away. Your job, your calling tonight is to give every burden and every worry, every stress, anything you can't control or... Listen, if you did stupid, made stupid, and made a wreck of it, this is self-inflicted stuff, guess what? Give it to Jesus. He'll take dumb mistakes why? Because he's taken mine. Stand our feet.